Hey, I'm Steve, also known as Terramantis, and in this video we're going to talk about 10 things that you may or may not know about Dark Souls 3. We'll cover topics that are based in lore, game mechanics, and things that are just simply fun to know, but all these Dark Souls topics are either obscure or widely unknown, and the topics will get more difficult as we go. So remember to play the game where if you learn something new you hit the like button, but if you knew absolutely everything, don't feel bad for one second to go S-talk spam someone to death for being so awesome. Alright, for the first one, we're going to take a look at the Stray Demon. What you probably already know is that, well, you can kill him. But what you may have not known is that he can die in several different ways. For one, he can obviously die in a completely normal fashion. Or, another way, if you continuously strike the same leg, it will crumble, causing the Stray Demon to fall down legless in an almost helpless fashion. In another way, when struck behind by a much larger weapon, both legs will crumble simultaneously, causing the Stray Demon to fall forward where he can then be struck with a critical attack. Alright, for the next one you'll need to find the Arch Dragon Peaks. At this location you can find a summoner that will summon NPC enemies constantly. It's almost always a Drake Blood Knight. But what you may not know is that if you haven't killed the real Havel of this area yet, the summoner can randomly and rarely conjure a Havel clone instead of a Blood Drake Knight. Mimics are bastards. Without question, I've been caught off guard more than once by a mimic in my Dark Souls career. Well, what you may not know is there's actually a way to spot them. First of all, the chain on a mimic is different. If it's a normal chest, it will be curved backwards, but if it's a Mimic, the chain is facing forward. Also, upon close inspection, you can actually see a Mimic needs to take a breath. And last but not least, if you just hate Mimics too much, you can go ahead and throw a Hunter's Talisman at it. This will cause the Mimic to fall asleep, and you can even take the loot out of its mouth while it's sleeping. Now, I know I said I hate Mimics, but actually in one situation, they kick ass. Literally. If you head down the broken bridge of the catacombs into the secret Isolith area, you run into a stray demon. Here, if you kite the demon upstairs and then smack the mimic to wake it up, that dirty bastard will kick the shit out of the demon. Love this little guy. The next topic has to do with accessing the later stages of the game much earlier. So what you may not know is that by killing Emma, the High Priestess of Lothric, you can initiate the boss fight with the Dancer much earlier than when it would automatically trigger by defeating three Lords of Cinder, meaning you'll have access to strong boss souls and the Sunbro Covenant in addition to farming large shards and chunks early. That said though, this is pretty difficult to pull off. I did it at level 33 and it was hard as hell. I was finally able to defeat her, but by rolling into her with Thorn Armor. It felt like I was one of those crappy fighting game players who wins with chip damage or a random kick to the shin. Now, if cheesing enemies with chip damage from your thorn armor isn't your thing, the next topic is a pretty cool tip for easily taking down the deacon boss fight. You know, with actual tactics. And here, normally the only sort of challenge in this boss encounter is attempting to manage a massive amount of enemies at one time. But what you may not know about this boss encounter is that the deacons of the deep are affected by the alluring skull. 
Yeah, if you throw several of these puppies throughout the fight, the undead will be attracted to it and walk toward the alluring skull, leaving the main enemy open and much easier to reach to kill. Now the next one involves following Henri's quest. If you're able to progress Anri's quest past the Karthus tombs, you'll eventually meet one another in Irithyll. Now, later, if you progress even farther, you'll eventually meet up with a pilgrim who tells you Anri is awaiting for a quote-unquote ceremony. Shortly after, you discover Anri is dead, and after performing the ritual, upon returning to the entrance of the chamber, you'll discover the pilgrim is dead as well, and on her corpse is the spell Chameleon. But what you may not know is that when you first met Anri in Irithyll, you can actually save her. Earlier in the questline, if you speak with Yuria, she'll inform you that she has an agent watching Anri, and hidden in the corner of the room where you first met Anri and Irithyll is a pilgrim obscured by the sorcery chameleon. If you kill this pilgrim here, Anri will not die in the ceremony. Instead, she'll progress and attempt to defeat Aldrich. The next few have to do with paying attention to detail, and this one has to do with the Witches of Isolith. From Dark Souls 1, we know that the Witch of Isolith had seven daughters one of which was named Koilana, and all of these witches dressed the same, donning black robes hemmed with gold. And you can find one of these sets of clothing by the witch's chaos transformed brother, the Ceaseless Discharge. But what you may not have noticed is a small detail that Koilana's pyromancy tome in Dark Souls 3 is wrapped by these same garments. If you look closely at the icon of the tome, you can clearly see the black cloth with a gold hem binding the book shut. Alright, the next one is also an Isolith. It's really just a closer look at the gigantic sandworm. You probably missed this just like me on my first several times through this area because the worm just moves so damn fast and, you know, the arrows and the lightning and, and, and the arrows and, 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 well, the lightning and, you know, crabs, there's crabs. Anyway, what you may not have noticed is if you take a close look at the sandworm, its insides look like it swallowed a massive amount of people like a snake. The compressed and suffocating faces of people can be seen screaming in their final agonizing moments through the taut skin of the creature. For the next one, we're going to talk about Egon and Arena. Well, as you may know, if you give Arena either the Londor Tome or the Deep Tome, she'll learn some dark miracles. Technically, nothing happens until you actually purchase one of these dark spells off her. If you purchase any of these dark miracles off her, Egon will take her away from the Firelink and attempt to save her from falling deeper into darkness. And here you're able to confront and kill Egon. Now here's the cool part, after killing Egon you can purchase his armor as well as return Arena to the Firelink Shrine. After this point Arena will ask you to touch her. Oh, is there no one here to touch me? Keep those things from eating away at me. And what you may not know is that there's a bit of secret dialogue here if you're wearing Egon's gauntlets. Thinking you're the knight sworn to protect her, Arena will say this out your hand and touch me. Oh, you again. Touch me one last time and kill me as you promised you would. For the last one, let's talk about Gertrude. Now, you may be asking, who is Gertrude? Well, she never actually makes an appearance in the vanilla Dark Souls 3 game, and she may or may not be dead, but Gertrude might just be one of the most important characters to the story of Dark Souls 3, a figure that may have even shaped the world of Lothric, and definitely had a great influence over the lives of Prince Lorien and Lothric, the final and broken Lord of Cinder. Alright, so first things first, it's heavily implied that Gertrude is the angelic daughter of Guinevere, the princess of sunlight and only daughter of Lord Gwyn, the first Lord of Cinder from the first Dark Souls. Now, Gertrude's mother-daughter relationship to Guinevere is heavily implied by the fact that Guinevere's ring states that she had several heavenly children, and then Gertrude is constantly referred to as the heavenly daughter. Also from item descriptions, we know that Gertrude was once the holy maiden of Queen Lothric, another character never seen in the game. But we do meet the queen's husband, the Consumed King, a character driven mad by experimentation into the knowledge of dragons. Now, during her service to the queen, intentionally or otherwise, Gertrude founded a religion based around her teachings after being visited by an angel. This angelic faith went against the ideology of the hierarchy of the Lothric kingdom who followed the three pillars of rule, knight, scholar, and priestess. And this religious heresy of Lothric rule is believed to be why Gertrude was eventually locked away in the High Tower of the Grand Archives. So why do we care about Gertrude and her imprisonment? 
Well, it's because what happened during her imprisonment that's important, and what took place during this time may actually explain a lot about Lorien and Lothric. It could explain why Lorien's crippled, why the brothers' souls are intertwined, and why each of them is cursed. Now this is where things get a bit more speculative, but follow me here. I believe during her imprisonment Gertrude was tortured or experimented on by the royal family of Lothric. Now from Prince Lothric's head, we know that the Lothric bloodline was obsessed with creating a worthy heir to link the flame. And what better means to find a secret to link the flame than a direct descendant of Gwyn, the first lord of Cinder, father of Guinevere, and grandfather of Gertrude. We also know that Gertrude was eventually imprisoned high above the Grand Archives, and Gertrude's chime states that she was defiled by the scholars of the Grand Archives. Additionally, we know Gertrude is repeatedly referred to as heavenly and angelic, and lining Gertrude's lofty prison are feathers spread out from a corpse like wings, and surrounding the bedchamber of Lothric, feathers are matted to the floor and spread all over the room. Alright, so let's recap. I think between environmental details and item description, there's enough evidence here to support the theory that the royal family, in their pursuit to make Lothric the perfect heir to link the flame, resorted to unspeakable means to achieve that end. As such, experimenting on Gertrude after coming to the belief that she was the granddaughter of Gwyn and the daughter of Guinevere, a direct descendant of the first Lord of Cinder. In the process of this defilement of Gertrude, Prince Lothric and Prince Lorien were instead cursed, crippling them both and rendering them unfit to return to the throne. Even though they were unsuccessful in gaining Gertrude's power of the Lord of Cinder, it would seem Lothric did inherit some of Gertrude's mastery over miracles. Now, after the royal family's failed attempts with Gertrude, the king looked to the dragons as a new answer to create the perfect heir and in the process was consumed by madness and created Ocelot, the invisible dragon child the king cradles that may or may not even exist. Now, lastly, Guinevere was known for her extremely powerful healing miracles, and this, in combination with the feathers around the bedchamber, suggests a connection to Gertrude, the daughter of Guinevere, and explains Prince Lothric's incredible power to heal, so much so that he's able to bring his brother Lorien back from the grip of death. Rise, if you would. For that is our curse. 